Good evening from Washington, DC. Um, I'm Karen Milborn, Senior Curator at the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art. And although we're gathered together today from different places and time zones, we gratefully acknowledge the native peoples on whose ancestral lands we gather. In the case of Washington, DC, the Anacostans are Nacochtank. In addition, we wish to recognize the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their home here today, as well as all those whose efforts contribute to the making of our nation's capital. In the case of the White House and US Capitol building, this included the labor of enslaved African Americans. Indeed, the original Smithsonian structure, known as the castle, was built with stone likely quarried by enslaved laborers, considered at the time to be owned by the great grandson of the United States' first first lady, Martha Custis Washington. For more on this history, look to the writings of Mark Auslander and Mabel Wilson. I am pleased to welcome all of you to tonight's event with artist Zena Sarawiwa. This event is part of Viewfinder, Women's Film and Video from the Smithsonian, a year-long virtual screening and conversation series featuring an array of moving image works by women from across the Smithsonian's collections and generously sponsored by the Smithsonian American Women's History Initiative. The first phase of the series focuses on the idea of interiority, understood physically, psychologically, or otherwise a particularly resonant theme during this global pandemic. Each virtual program of the series will occur on the first Thursday of every month. Next month's program is Margaret Salmon on motherhood and the everyday, taking place on April 1st, 5 p.m. Eastern time. For more information about the upcoming events in the series, please visit www.womenshistory.si.edu. We have live closed captioning available, which can be accessed along the bottom of your menu, as can the Q&A function, into which you are invited to submit questions to be answered during the second half of the event. So thank you for joining us this, for this special screening of Zina Sarawiwa's Saragua Morning, soon to be part of the National Museum of African Arts time-based media collection. In fact, this acquisition was made possible with funds from the American Women's History Initiative um, Accessions Fund. An interdisciplinary artist working across video, film, sculpture, sound, curation, food, and recently drink, Zena Sarawiwa is known for the intimate and direct manner by which she explores the slippages between interior experience and exterior appearance and the representations and misrepresentations of Africans on the continent and beyond. It was with Sarah Gua Morning that Sarah Wiwa began to feel herself to be truly an artist. For this 12 minute film, she shaved her head in recognition of the morning rituals of her Ogoni heritage and recorded herself crying for her father, the activist and poet Ken Sarah Wiwa. She had not found this personal act of grieving and outrage possible in the wake of his highly publicized execution by the Nigerian military government 10 years earlier. So now please join us in viewing Sarah Gua Morning, followed by live conversation with the artist, Zina Sarawiwa. So Zina, you can, uh, there you are. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's such an honor to have you and um, to be um, bringing this work into our collection. Um, but I thought maybe to start the conversation tonight, I mean, this work is so incredibly raw. Maybe just talk a little bit about the your technique in making it. Were you alone in the room? How did you create the staging? Um, I wasn't alone. I was um, with a friend and I had asked her to do the filming for me. I knew that it wasn't something that I could do by myself. And um, first of all, let me just say thank you for having me. And I'm delighted also that this piece is in your care. Um, it's, as I said, as you say, a very raw piece. And, um, and it matters where it's shown and how it's looked after. 
in a sense. And so um, I'm glad that it's, that it's with you. But no, it was a friend that was filming me and I, um, I kind of wanted that sense of performance in a way. So that's why I've got that red background and that kind of raw silk that was there. So it had that kind of like luxury and sort of um, theatricality about it. And then I also kind of wanted the sort of um, 3D kind of to be in like a, in, a, in a box. So it's almost like you were like a, in a peep show of some description. So you could look through the peep show and then there's this person in this box, but you know, emoting and crying and, and grieving and being naked in a different way than maybe a peep show might have been, but it was a different yeah. kind of peep show, sort of a very emotionally sort of raw and naked piece. But then also the fact that I was um, maybe naked or maybe not, I actually don't remember if I was or not, I actually don't remember. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so there is that suggestion of uh, nudity, but then there was certainly the emotional nakedness as well. And I do feel like that kind of idea of being in a kind of box with the red um, suggests a sense of sort of a private but public performance. I mean, I think it's something that certainly appears in, in other of your works as well, but I mean, I find in so much of your work, there really is this dialogue between intimacy and confrontation um, that comes to the fore. And I thought maybe, I mean, I was just wondering how you think about that. You know what though, I feel like sometimes I just sort of do things that I just think are interesting. And then I sort of realize afterwards or other people tell me that oh, that was a bit difficult to watch or that was a bit, you know, intimate or whatever. And so, um, but no, I do think um, the idea of putting those things into the foreground and forcing you to observe it and look at it and meditate on it or use it as a meditative aid. Um, so I've done crying and then there was kissing and then there's eating and then there's praying. So I've done those four, four <laughs> actions. And um, yeah, I mean, I think when I when I think about sort of what connects them in a sense, I was I think growing up in the UK, you know, the, your storytelling as as an African in the UK was always done for you, especially in the eighties, nineties, and certainly before that, it wasn't we weren't really in charge of our storytelling in many ways, which is why the advent of social media, you know, despite its many pitfalls, is also amazing because it means that there are more people in control of their storytelling. But growing up in the UK, you weren't in control of that. And I always felt like I suffered as a result in many ways. I couldn't tell, I always felt the need to tell our stories because I felt that, I, you know, we were being misunderstood in some ways. And, you know, bringing that internal into the external, I think is maybe a part of that on some level, but I'm um, not being so prescriptive necessarily. I'm not giving, I use these um, actions in a way, but the viewer ends up supplying the narrative actually. So I've actually given up control of storytelling in some ways, but I do feel that, you know, in a sense, encouraging or forcing, I suppose, let's just say it is, it's forcing the viewer to, deal with uh, this action, this eating, this kissing, this crying, or what have you, forcing them to deal with that is um, a form of, you know, yes, getting intimate with with with, with certain kinds of Africanness or Blackness, absolutely. Because that, I suppose, never really happened, that, that hadn't happened very much. I think now nowadays, I mean, we take it for granted a bit, those sides of um, Black and African life are, are being opened up. It's, you know, it's still a journey, but that has happened. But I think back then it was really not, the case, and I'm not, I'm only talking like nine years ago, I'm not talking like ages ago, but I still feel like even then at that time, it felt like, you know, we need to be able to tell these stories and also figure out what, um, you know, you know, what black authenticity is and isn't, you know, I sort of, I didn't think about those things until I was, I left boarding school at the age of 18 and then I was sort of thrust into a world that, you know, kind of had issues with my, my identity as a black person. And so then I then I started thinking about those things, but I never did before. And so I think that a lot of my work is partly about that. But then also I think when it, you know, when you bring in the whole Niger Delta and Nigeria aspect of what in what happened to my father, that brings on a whole different layer on top of all of that in terms of how we think about um you know what happened, what actually happened. Because the question of what happened is such a big question. And, you know, it's, it's, and this film, you talked about, you know, mentioned how I felt like it was the first time, of, you know, the first time I felt like an artist. And it wasn't the first art piece I'd made. I'd made a, no, a different no. film before that, two, two movies and a, but it was the first time I felt like an artist because I, I forced myself to be in it. I, I, you know, I used art to confront something for myself. Um, and so, um, 
so yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I'm sort of going around in circles here, I suppose. But um, yeah, the, the work itself did also force the um, the issue of the private mourning that had that was buried underneath the very public and political um, veneer of my father's death. You know, the, the the forcing the intimacy is, I think, a part of encouraging people to understand that this happened to a family, this happened to people, not just like yeah. a movement or an idea. So, I mean, I guess, I mean, to me, I guess an aspect of that shift is, as you were saying, I mean, it was focusing on yourself or putting yourself in it. And it also changes then in a way who you're thinking about when you're making it. And I mean, one of the things that I've been thinking about, you know, having seen the work of, you know, a few times now, um, is there's always in me this sort of sense of voyeurism, you know, why am I watching this piece? Should I be watching this piece? Um, and, you know, is it because it's art with a capital A? And, and I think that, you know, your work, like I was saying, there's, there's always a tension between confrontation and intimacy, but there's something else with this piece because it is so deeply personal. I mean, there is this sort of, um, you know, profound confrontation, this really very real wrestling that you were going through and that then we have to go through, like, are we gonna let ourselves distance ourselves from this as something aesthetic or are we going to engage with the subject? I mean, you're saying that, but I feel the same way too. I mean, I distanced myself from it, I did it, but I, I barely, I don't watch it. I actually forced myself to watch it this time, but oh, did I, was, you? Oh, I did. Sorry. I know I told you I wasn't going to watch it because I never do because I always end up crying. But this time I, well, I said I watched it, but then I still had my phone. You know, I was like that distance of like always having your phone looking up and, you know, and I just, I wasn't in it. And mm -hmm. also aestheticizing it is also totally a part of choreographing mm -hmm. pain, you know, and that's how you manage pain through the choreography of it. And so, yeah, art was, um, was ritual it was you know this is an art piece but it was also just real it's not like yes it was actually made it was actually commissioned by a gallery and mm -hmm. I made it knowing that it was up but also I it is a it, it is real it isn't mm -hmm. well, it's the whole question about my work anyway what's performance and what is real and the role of performance in um transforming reality or expressing reality or revealing reality um so um but it, yeah it's a totally real piece I went to places I didn't want to go and I've never allowed myself to go but I was safe to go because it was for an art piece mm -hmm. um but no I you know it's just I went to horrible like horror places and like, it's not you know and it's real and it's like it's not it's yeah yeah anyway so that's why I don't watch it <laughs> that's because it's it's also real it's actually, um, and I was actually crying for the first time. So um, yeah, it was, um, but the art is the permission. And for me, I, I, I keep saying, I say this in every talk I do, but it's, you know, art for me is about permission. And, you know, the permission to go to these places, the permission to um, emotionally go to that place and then to breathe in that way, you know, that's what I'm so grateful for in that sense. So um, yes, it was also for my own personal confrontation too, I was able to confront. So it's as much for the viewer as it was for me, an act of like, okay, forcing myself to deal with something that I hadn't dealt with before. This actually maybe is a good transition then to show a work that you made a year earlier and you have prepared an, am an amazing all new composition of um, morning class, but to me, there's so much, you know, richness that comes from the juxtaposition between, between these two pieces. So, so maybe we could cue that up and watch that for, it's about three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I so love the cut <laughs> that you made of that work. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's great. That's a so, so I did someone, um, an actress and, um, naturopath and all around amazing person. That she was the one that ended it, yeah. So for people who don't realize, um, morning classes, uh, Zena commissioned a number of Nollywood actresses to cry. And I actually thought maybe you could, <laughs> one of my questions is, did you cue them when to start and when to stop? Because that's part of what's so amazing to me is, is the performance of it. Yeah, so the piece is actually, just to be clear, like 15 monitors, between 15 and 21 monitors. 
and I tend to look for analog TVs and there is it's actually a sculpture but um I never oh, the, no, I've, only, we can I've only shown it once as a sculpture at the Pulitzer Foundation and that was a great opportunity and also in um, Denmark as well that's it exactly it's supposed to look more like that and um and each actress gets her turn I believe yeah it's like one actress at a time it, I've strung together the performances but their performances are refracted over all these multiple screens and we have some of the like TVs having a strop you know just having a, <laughs> a meltdown that sort of face down and um yeah yeah it's a really fun installation and like I'm dying for an opportunity to show it again. But yeah, um, so I filmed different actresses. I think I did one in London, I did one or two in New York, I did some in Nigeria as well. There's about four or five actresses in it. Um, uh, but I cut that especially for this. And so you could just see a little bit of, you know, the women sort of crying together. But um, yeah, I, I was, you know, the reason I kind of made it, I think it was, it was Nollywood. Nollywood has always inspired me. Nollywood is a thing that gave me the fire and the inspiration just to go off and do things by myself. That's what I love about Nollywood. I love that about Nigerians, just like getting up and just, you know, what they always say about Nollywood is that we jumped off, as the Nollywood filmmakers, we jumped off a cliff and learned how to um, enter this into the ocean and learn how to build the boats whilst we're in the water. And I'm like, oh, that's me. That's exact. That's me in my art career. That's me in everything that um, I've sort of done in many ways. So, um, um, so Nollywood was the thing that inspired me, but also this kind of the also the the problematics of Nollywood inspired me too. So always the women crying, and I remember seeing one time for some reason just watching this close up, that kind of very melodramatic close up of. Um, a woman crying and I just couldn't stop laughing and it just sort of like did something to me and then this piece sort of came out of it and so yes it was asking these actresses to cry for the camera but then I also asked them to break it at the end um with a smile so we knew that it was a performance to demarcate that so yeah I would ask them to you know it was like action and then um we'll see how long it would take and they would cry and you know did I um I think you were asking whether I, I did I direct them um, I mean, there was a certain, um, there was a little bit of direct, I mean, if they weren't looking up enough, then I would need them to like engage with the camera because it wasn't, please look up at the camera. It's not just about keeping your head down. I needed the engagement. So that was part of it. I needed as much engagement with the camera as possible. But, you know, obviously they were genuine, apart from one of them, they were all genuinely, they were genuinely performing, but they, you know, when I asked them about where they went to get there to access those tears, um, you know, about three or four of them actually went to a particular place or moment or a death or whatever, and that's what got them to that that place. And so, yeah, I had to, you know, there was direction in that sense, please look at the camera, please look at the camera. And then, um, you know, mostly I would just have to let it run its course and um, the, the main actress there, the first one, she, one minute, um, her, oh God, her name's Kate Henshaw Nussel, very famous Nigerian actress and wonderful, wonderful person. And she completed hers in like an hour, uh, a minute and a half and it was amazing. But then sometimes it would go on for a really long time and then it's like, you know, crying is like a performance in a way. There is like, you know, <laughs> there is exposition, there is developments, there's like, coders and you know composition wise I'm like okay this has gone a little bit too long I'd be like okay bring it in bring it in let's like <laughs> shut this down <laughs> so there's definitely that and you know sometimes you're convinced by a crying, crying performance and other times you're not convinced by a, a, a crying performance because it is a performance and and actually I don't know if you do this but if you ever feel this when you're crying certain kinds of cries feel like a good cry and then there's some rubbish cries where like the physicality or the sound and it's just like it doesn't come together to quite pull it off where it doesn't elicit the thing it's supposed to purge you of you know so there's good cries and there's like not so great cries and so but with this it was a difficult thing I didn't want to like push them too hard so there'll be a I think maybe one or two performances. It was a, literally the very first video art piece I've ever made in my life, like the first piece of art. So, you know, I was just still learning in a sense what I didn't really know kind of what was I gonna push them? How many times should I do that? These are all big questions. And I, but I also kind of like the freshness of just maybe getting the first take or the second take. I don't, I know I didn't do more than two takes because also it's impossible. It's like once you, it's just, it's really, really difficult because also it wasn't just, there was no like, um, drama there was no like text or sorry or uh, dialogue to like disappear into or any action there was just they were just there so it's a harder thing to sort of it's much harder it's a harder thing to um 
you know, ask them to keep repeating it because it's not in service to a particular wider narrative. So I'm really forcing them to go there in a way that is very difficult. They're in a well and there's no support. They're just like, you just got to do this thing. Um, and you're giving your own narrative. There's no other wider narrative to support you. And this is an in aid of another scene. And this is you here. So I, for these reasons, I did not force them to do it more than once or twice. So, um, but yeah, it was, yeah, it's a, I, it's a performance. And so I had to direct them, sure. Did it play any role in your decision to make Sargo a morning? You know, in asking these? Yeah, I think so, for sure, for sure. And also this thing of like, I don't, I actually, I'd love to remember what made me think I had to make myself do it. When I made that, when I, when there was that realization that I had to do it, I was like, mm -hmm. oh, it's, Cause that was huge. That's like a huge moment when you suddenly realize that you have to put yourself in it. That wasn't a given for me. I didn't go to art school where it will study, you know, the legions of artists that have like put themselves in their art or did, or, you know. I. You went to Nollywood. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, you might, I was always externalizing everything. I was never really, it's never, the only time I was, you know, I was in the frame is when I, you know, there was going to be this idea of me doing a documentary about my father when I felt ready to, but then, you know, every time I tried to like do a pitch at a production company around London, I'd end up crying. I was like, wow, okay, I'm really not ready to <laughs> pitch yeah. a documentary. And we tried making one and it's just like, nah, it's not about this. And so art was the only way, because then, it, you know, with art, you can choose and you can create the framework and you know how it's you know it's not within like a documentary kind of format you know you're inventing format you're querying format you know this is like 3d this 4d 5d this is when it, with art so there's all these different implications and nothing you don't have to you know you, i can bring into the conversation whatever i wanted to so the idea of me doing it suddenly um was like an opportunity actually you know it's like wow i can actually confront this thing and get it over with you know this is the mm. documentary that I wanted to make and also the conversation I want to have is is bigger and growing and it's like ever expanding and it's still here you know it's like someone once asked me oh are you um ever gonna like stop talking about like Agoni and your dad and all this stuff and I'm like mm, mm, probably not because like when you do that to someone or to a family it's not just something you get over it's like the implications of what happened was so much bigger than the people who signed off a piece of paper and said, oh, let's, just, let's have this thing happen. Let's just hang nine people. You know, it's not that small. It's actually way, way, way bigger than that. And, you know, they picked the wrong people to do this too. I feel like there's like so much conversation and I was born someone who's in touch with all these different elements. And I'm just like, I have to make sense of it. I can't just like put it away and decide not to do anything about it. It's like, no, I've got to do something about this. And so all my work is now about this in a sense, but um, this, film was the first time of like okay dealing with that you know one aspect of it but then this is like no 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 there's so much more going on but there's so much more that's light and about growth and life and for you know that's like this is like uh, this darker period that I, I feel like I had to go through and like my work now even if it's still about like Agoni but it's also like about the world and it's cosmic and it's like but it comes from that place and that's what is in that place. It was always there, you know, this whole, the whole thing of just characterizing this place by like oil and death is the problem. You know, when you start to like dig into it's like the magic that's actually there, when you dig into the, um, it's natural, you know, the, the fecundity, the fact that it is this incredible natural environment and when you sort of dig into that history you know because they you know what we just ignored that we just talked about and rang our hands over all the oil but when it's just like no 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 but you know we know that okay if we're anti what happened what are we for so understanding that that is also part of this work part of the reverberation of this death so yes it was the thing that kind of i think flipped flipped things and i could like deal with manage the death in this really like in this art is so beautiful i love art so much in some way i hate art so i, I hate the art world i love art um <laughs> because then it kind of because <laughs> then it sort of like it sort of like dealt with this ache and this thing of like in you know, the impossibility of 
dealing with something like this, the, the privacy and the publicity, the publicness of the death and the privacy that was not allowed and all those questions. You just deal with it with a gesture. I'm like, thank you, done, but not done. It's just this thing that's living and will reverberate. And, but it's also like, I don't have to make that work anymore, but the work is continuing, but I don't, I've, I've done it now, boom, on to the next. And so I kind of like, I enjoy art for that anyway. And so, um, but the next stuff is still about it, but it's rooted in it, but it's like going in these other lovely directions that I'm, you know, that are much less obviously sad on the surface. Um, how did you come to the title of the work? Oh yeah, um, that's an interesting one. Um, hold on, my computer is about, I forgot to plug it in. <laughs> hold on one second. Um, the magic of TV and Zoom. Um, yeah, the name was, um, yeah, it's a really weird one because, you know, I think at, at that that was the time when I started thinking about, um, hmm. I've talked about digging into like, well, who we are as Agonis, not just like this identity of like oil and violence, etc. And, you know, then you start to look into your traditional religions and start to think about, you know, um, you know, I started asking about, well, our pre-Christian belief systems, because in our part of the world, we're not Yorubas. And I think the Yoruba deities, etc., are very well known because they're spread across the world and there's this real, and the storytelling is there. But, you know, I'm not from there. I'm from uh, a part of Nigeria where actually, you know, it's very individual, individuated. It's not actually this kind of these, you know, figures that, you know, um, that means something for, for multiple people. It's very, very, very individuated. So for me to learn about that was actually quite hard, especially when people don't want to talk, talk about that because they're Christian. So anyway, I had to learn about, well, you know, which god or goddess that was a goni could, you know, would resonate with this. And then I heard about, mm -hmm. I think I spoke to my uncle, he mentions of like Saragua or whatever. I was like, oh, that's a nice one. And I was like, it's about the rain god. I was like, cool, that's a rain god. And that's about crying, mourning, perfect. So I use that. And then when I was like Googling it, you know, I Google all my titles just to see how like, you know, unique it is or not. And then I came across a, a poem that my father wrote called For Saragua. I was like, oh man. And the, and the, he's like saying the same thing about washing away pain. I'm like, oh my God. That was just like amazing, amazing to discover that. But that was like after the fact. I didn't, I had no idea he'd written a poem called For Saragua. You bring this up in the artwork itself. Um, but you just touched on this like with your with your father's poem as well. And that's something that I don't think it's addressed enough in your work, and that is the fact of joy. <laughs> you know, and I thought maybe you could speak to that because you are laughing, we are smiling, yeah. and the importance of catharsis as part of this as well. Yeah, you know, thank you so much for saying this, because yeah, it's um I think like my family, we're always, we've always, we're just, despite everything, we're just fairly joyful people, always like, always laughing, always, you know, we've all got a great sense of humor. Um, and so, yeah, you know, it's in everything I do. And I just, you know, I don't, I hate kind of like misery guts. People are just like asking me. And, you know, the thing is, if I revelled in the misery and people, I think, you know, when all this stuff happened, everyone would, you know, would, you know, they'd make this horrible documentary about my dad and like there's a horrible picture of him when he was like, being sentenced to death and there's this video of him and I'm like I don't want to watch this this is I can't live that I live there I'm from there I can't like be there all the time but then you have the kind of hand-wringing kind of like NGO type people or other people who just like for some reason cleave to the drama and love it and need it for some reason but and want you to reflect that and I'm like, I cannot live there or else I will die because this is my story so no thank you um, and also personally, I was born joyful and I choose, I have to survive anyway. I have to like, you know, I have to live there. And it's also just my personality. And I think it's also just a Nigerian thing too. It's just like, you know, finding humor in like a very bleak situation. So that's what we do. And so, yeah, I'm just being myself. It's not like I'm purposely trying to find joy. It's just like, no, no, no. I've just decided not to let everything like pain define me and just go into where I live naturally and just to grow that bit of myself. So yeah, all my, my best work has a lot of natural humor in it. And um, well, it's because it's, it's the most me, it's me, you know, allowing, getting other things out of the way and letting the actual core of me come out. And so those are always the best works. And 
yeah, there has to be joy or else how do you live? I just, you know, people who just want you to wallow or to perform pain for you can just like piss off as far as I'm concerned, you know, because you don't, you don't want to change anything. You just want to live and dwell in that pain because you find some sort of weird identity out of it, some sort of sense of self out of it. And I don't. So, you know, actually it's really important to, to look for, you know, to, to seek joy, well, seek life seek life and not be obsessed with death and not be obsessed with, you know, with pain or murder or whatever it is, you know, the only way to transcend that is, uh, is through life. And that's my only way to have survived as many deaths in my family as we've survived. So that's, you know, that's the only way that I know. And I hope to continually, and I think the next few works, it, it's all about joy, but then there's this, always a seriousness in, um, you know, in joy and in beauty. You know, those things, those, these are codes. I think always think of beauty as a, as a portal, you know? It, it does that kind of pleasure, that it does something to you and it takes you somewhere. There's like, there's, it's, not, it's not a shallow thing. There's something important about beauty or symmetry or, or joy. It's an energy, it's a technology to get you to a particular place. And so I want to utilize that technology to transcend pain and not wallow in it. And so I find people that might be well-meaning, but only want to sort of focus on this and think that that's the way of solving anything. So it's not going to solve anything. You know, if you're an NGO worker that's obsessed with those, you, you pay your mortgage, but how does it actually help the people? It does nothing. So what we have to do is access what is, has always been ours, you know, an elemental strength that has always been ours, that is God given that no one else can give you. It's like in us all already. So that's what we, it behooves us to seek that out and let it emerge. That's the only thing that will save you. I mean, that raises, I guess, the question of how you construct your narratives. I mean, you, you are very seductive in just the incredible technique, <laughs> technique and, um, and, you know, your, your manner of presentation, which really does range. And, and we are going to, before um, going to questions, allow people to actually see the work that you're currently working on. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think that that does provide sort of a bit of comparison for those who might not have seen some of your other works between how you work with um, plot lines or, you know, a narrative presentation, as well as what I would sort of think of in my own head is a more distilled or experiential approach like you take with um, Sargo Morning and Morning Class. But I thought maybe you could talk about, because you were talking about how every cry has its own arc and all of your stories have an arc to them. So how do you sort of build your narrative um, direction? Um, and I'm sorry that my lights keep going in and out. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I can't control it. <laughs> I feel like everything has inbuilt narrative. So when I make an eating film, it's like there is narrative implicit in it. Everything has like narrative arc. And I'm I'm only interested in narrative arc. I know there's like lots of like video art that seems to be against that and will do anything to sort of like piss off the viewer. But my I wanna keep you. I wanna what I want you to stay watching something and you don't understand why you're still there. You know, it's the thing that Nollywood does, you know, you're just like, you're laughing, you're thinking, oh, this is like hilarious or blah, 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 or, and it's just like offensive on some level and blah, 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 but you're still there two hours later watching it. And that interests me. It's like, what is, what is that? You know, I like things that are popular. I'm very interested in things that are popular and why they keep you. That interests me. But, um, but whenever I try, I mean, I, you know, I try to do like really popular things, but it doesn't come out that way. <laughs> I just like, can't be normal. I'm trying though, believe me. You know, my dream you is- You are the meme queen, so. Uh, I am the meme queen, but we, memes are abnormative too, you know? And, um, but yeah, I, I do, I, I strive to make like normal sunny things, but it never quite works that way. It's, like, it's just always weird, but it also, but it makes me laugh too. There is narrative arc in everything. And humans, this is an atavistic part of human identity where we, you know, I mean, it's such an interesting thing though when you think about it actually. So now I'm like wondering, you know, what is a narrative arc? You know, but you know, but why also? You know, is there, it's, it's like, but why? Beginning, middle and end, why? Why? Why not a circle? And also if it is a spiral, what does that mean? It's just like, it's crazy when you think about it. It's crazy to think that that's what humans like and need and understand. And I think, I think it's a universal that humans, around the world believe in a beginning, middle and end. I think that there are 
cultural systems of thought that are much more cyclical or, uh, you know, I think we have come to consider it normative, but I don't think that that means that it is so. But then can you have a, a spiral that's also an arc? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, really like the shape of it, the kind of like the architecture and the geometry of reality is very, very, very interesting. Anyway, sorry, arcs and everything. What was the question? Sorry, I, I forgot what you- I guess it was how do you construct it? But you know, some to, I'm gonna build on that now. So sorry, this is what you get for asking a question back at me. Um, you know, you were talking earlier about art as permission, but um, you know, it's also, I think that what you do in a way, I'm not sure if even permission is the right word in terms of the viewer. It is to me a little bit more confrontational, but, um, but you bring an awareness to the idea of emotions like love and, and grief, um, but very much in a sense of where do we have them? Why are we having them? When are we having them? How are we allowing them to happen? I mean, you really sort of distill that emotional experience. And so I think you do either work through this sort of experiential approach or a more narrative approach to accomplish this permission, if you will. But I was wondering how you think towards storyboarding, I suppose, was the original question. Yeah, that's, yeah, because, yeah, because one assumes that I do do that. I don't do anything like I'm supposed to. I don't do things like storyboards. <laughs> like, I have to tell you that with this latest film of my, I mean, okay, let's take like my um, Phyllis film or like my first two old Hollywood films, The Deliverance of Comfort is the other one. And um, I didn't know until I sort of got to Nigeria what I might do. And even then it was kind of more improvised. Um, I took a lot of photographs, et cetera, and sort of studies in the sense to have a sense of the aesthetic places I might go to, but everything else was more like um, channeled slightly, to be honest with you. But if you channel, then it's just like, you'll just have access in a different realm, which also has its own logic and arts and narratives too. So you have to trust the channeling. So that's kind of how that, that's where that comes from. And with Eukarya, um, I'm kind of a little bit stuck. I always think of it, I wanna say that, I feel really bad saying that because, you know, I don't want people to have, to lack confidence in it as a project as a project because I don't lack confidence and I'm not fundamentally perturbed when I don't know where it's going it doesn't fundamentally perturb me even though I don't enjoy it like right now I'm in a very weird place but it's revealing itself to me as to what it is so I always think of the elephant you know the story about the blind men who are like touching different bits of the elephant and they're describing the elephant and they think oh an elephant has like ridges and it's long and oh an elephant is wide and it's because they're touching all different bits of the elephant but it's all one elephant it's all the elephant and so we are in this realm blind people and our ideas and our art forms live as real beings mm. in this other realm and I'm just like touching it and trying to figure out what it is and what its shape is and it's not always an arc it might yeah. be an elephant it might be I don't know what it so this film is like is it a film is it a video installation is it a bit of both how am I constructing you know and so that's um so constructing art and narrative, especially when it's an art film, it's like you 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 have that much more freedom in a way. And and I can run back to arc a narrative arc and an atavistic pull whenever I need to, but then art, as you, as I say, gives you permission to like try something else completely. And I'm toying with something a little bit more radical than I was expecting with this film in terms of the direction that it's going. And I'm like, Eesh, am I allowed to? I'm like, yeah, art says you're allowed to. But art also allows you to step back and then maybe go to the other side and figure out, oh, it is an elephant, you know? So that's what, you know, but if you were like making other kinds of films where there's like a budget and it's really difficult, you know, and there's lots of people involved, then you kind of have to know what you're gonna do and let it happen, which is also a great way of making films, but it's just not my way. Um, so um, arc, but I think arc, and shape and plot it's, it's it's actually there it's just that i haven't twigged yet it's like my fault i have to like it's there it's already there it's already living and it's complete it's complete mm. it's done um but i it hasn't finished coming through me or i haven't let it or something hasn't happened that needs to happen i know what has to happen i have to go i have to go to the, the desert and that's what i'm fundraising for to get do a trip with my actress constance juma to go to the desert and do some shooting and figuring out and let the desert tell me what it is or me in the desert tell mm -hmm. me what needs to happen next because that's the bit I'm stuck at. 
So this is probably a great moment then to queue up Eukarya, which is the work that you are currently um, finding. Um, but before screening it, I do the excerpt is about 12 minutes long, but I want to warn audiences that this clip includes graphic imagery related to suicide, and it is not appropriate for all audiences. If you are experiencing suicidal thoughts, help is available. Please call 800-273-8255. Um, so if we could start, you call it. So thank you for um, sharing that powerful piece with us. And I guess before starting on the questions, I did wanna ask a bit about how um, you envision it being presented and also just presentation more broadly in your work, how you stage your pieces, because, you know, Sarah Gua Morning, which we didn't really talk about, it's your sort of life size. It's a really one-on-one -on -one relationship between the viewer and, and the work. And then that's quite different in morning class, which is so sculptural. So I was wondering if you could talk about those and then that in relationship to, to this work as well. I mean, I think size, there's so many considerations when it comes to like video art and even when it's a very simple kind of film or a simple action, it's it's actually even more complicated. You've got to think about size, you want to think about speed, you want to think about colour, you want to think about placement. It's just like suddenly there's like the whole world is open to you because it's not just necessarily um, you know, a, you know, a flat screen on a wall. You know, you have multiple dimensions and many things that you can play with in video, art and sculpture. So um, yeah, for a lot of the Ogoni work, I like it. I like people's faces to be the size of a person's face so that you meet the person. And with uh, table manners, people are sitting down. So I want people to sit down with the person and, you know, watching them eat. And uh, the crying films, you know, the, ideally it's human height and human size. So you can, but you know, it's been projected on like massive walls. So I've been like 20 feet, like my face is 20 feet and crying. So that's, you know, happened before and I enjoy that too. But, you know, I think it's a different, where it's shown is like always a different conversation. And I'm actually weirdly open to like interpretations. And I think that, you know, curators should be like, art oh, is, is, it's an art form curating. And, you know, if there's a really good reason to show it in a particular way that I'm kind of like, okay, let's, let's try it, I suppose. You know, I'm always up for like new ideas, but, but, for the most part so far it's been like this idea of like person to person and that connection I'm trying to draw with people from the outside of a Goni land and people within a Goni land so you actually meet the situation and the people as people so there's that that aspect of it um with Yukari it's like wow it's so it's it's always evolving but right now it's it's still a film but it's like a four-hour film <laughs> but then it's also a video installation and so you know I said I I've moved into joy and I, I know that was really sad, but the, it does move into a kind of weird warped joy. It sort of turns into a color. She sort of dies in the bath and she's not necessarily dead. It's the whole thing is the, the arc of the film is her dying slowly in the bath or just choosing whether to return to her body or to, to go on. But then she goes to a place called Desert Bardo. So the Bardo in at least and religious religions is the, the place you go, you know, like the place after death that you go, the kind of almost like purgatory, the place, you know, the, the stages of bardos that lead you to um, the afterlife. And, um, but I can see a bit as well. I just like the name as well. I mean, it was an idea, this desert place anyway, that's just in me, but the name Bardo lent itself. So that's why I borrowed it. And mm. it's a desert Bardo. And in that Bardo, she, um, um, she has to complete a task, which is to find and kill God and um, things happen. And she uh, she falls in love with the earth through fruit and it's very joyful and interesting. And so the fruit eating, I mentioned this only because I want to draw that out as a video installation. And, you know, and I think I would probably want to show it in that way. And also there's so many kind of weird sort of chapters in this film. And I was thinking, could, could it be, I always imagine like a circular installation and the eating, film, she's eating different fruits. And they're really joyful and sexy and fun, like the eating, the fruit eating scenes. And they're gonna be in like beautiful environments, desert environments, et cetera. So it's gonna be really beautiful. So they're just beautiful in themselves and they will be embedded in the body of the film as a film. If I just wanted to show it as a normal sort of flat screen film, but I think also I'd like an iteration of it, which is more sculptural and installation like. So we have like monitors which show the kind of eating films as, you know, separate, um, uh, video installations but then maybe the different chapters because the first 
all the LA bits of the film are shot in black and white and then everything else in Desert Bardo is in color. And then there's this wonderful, so different environments will contain different scenes that happen. And then there's uh, my favorite scene, which I haven't shot yet, but we're going to hopefully soon, where she meets um, White Christ emerging from the water and sort of like Malibu and he's like blonde and aging but still sexy and she has this weird encounter with white christ to some excellent music in the background <laughs> it's gonna be so awesome and the thing is i can't decide on the actor i i, I i'm sort of favoring a lot of like you know a kind of a-list actors that are kind of like you know handsome Aryans. so um <laughs> and so i was like oh if it's a video i can have all of them i have my list is like five or six of them i'm like do i have to choose i'm thinking <laughs> I, don't know. I, don't know. I think I might just go with all of them if they'll say yes and then I have an installation bit, bit where it's all like but then when I think about that I'm like oh but can I put that in the body of the that affects how I'm thinking about the actual just like the straight narrative film like oh but could I put the multiple performances in the one film can I collapse it how would I do that what does it mean for the story arc if I had multiple white Christ what does that mean you know so this is why this film is making me like because eh, it's like so much to potentially think about and the fact that you know I'm allowing art into it and making it an art, you know, the fact it is, it's coming from a place, my art, my art self, not even my film self, it's coming from my art self. And it's inhabiting film a bit, but it's also art. And that jumping back and forth is frankly dizzying, but also potentially expansive. Yeah, really rewarding. All right, <laughs> so on, I, I think I will start letting all of the many questions that are starting to come in. Um, so from Aditola Abatan, um, he Hi, has written, Hmm? Can I choose which ones I answer? Oh, sure, absolutely. Yeah. You can you can you should ask it though. The first one is fine. Um, so he writes powerful work, Xena. I love how you said it matters how it is shown and how it is looked after. So he's speaking about Sarah Go Morning. Mm. And then the question is, do you worry about the white gaze on the showing of black pain? Uh, no, because that presumes that any white people go to museums and watch it, or they'll be shown. I'm sure that there'll be like Chinese people watching it, Korean people watching it, Hawaiian people watching it, Nigerian people watching it, Rwandan people watching it, Brazilian people watching it. So no, I think that all sorts of people hopefully will watch the work and, you know, um, but I do have my, yes, my concerns for like the performance of, of Black Pain, but it's also like, um, cool, yeah. Um, you know, I've talked a lot about how, you know, you know, when you sort of like the pornography of black pain is just something I've always cleaved against in some way. But because this is an art piece, um, I feel more in control of it. And also the architecture around the work, and that's why the art art world is useful in that sense, because you do get to invite it to be talk to talk about it. And there is like writing around it, and there's all this, there's a scaffolding around. It. it's not it doesn't just exist as a piece it's like there's a lot that comes with it so you know I always think of art as a really interesting way of protecting ideas and mm -hmm. so you know I would worry if I was just like someone just crying on a on a news channel and they're just like showing yet another black person crying on the street with no context but this is like full of context and background and you know so much that helps sort of furnish and prop up the idea that I'm displaying in this work. So um, I'm not worried about it because it's an art piece. So you said you wanted to pick the question, so go yeah, for it. Yeah, please don't be upset if I don't answer. I just, you know, don't feel like it. <laughs> um, the agony elements in the film. Okay, could you talk about specifically agony elements in the film in addition to your shaved head? Um, what is, I don't know, there's, I don't know, I just shaved my head. That's only one of the ways you spoke, you know, that you can show grief with your, you can also just let your hair just grow wild. That's another way of showing it. Um, but I am a goni. Is that enough? I think maybe. Um, I've talked about my forthcoming movie, Eucaria, which I am so excited about. And I think it's gonna be amazing. We've shot like 30 minutes of it, 30 minutes of it. And um, well, I've cut 30 minutes from all I've shot. I shot 30 minutes, shot hours, but cut it down to like 30 minutes and, um, um, yeah, I shot most of LA, but, you know, wanting to shoot all my white Christs and I'm wanting to shoot um, um, the desert scenes and there's some constructed sets that we need. So there's, it's, it's going to be a fantastic piece. So looking forward to like um, finding a way to get getting that done. Um, um, right. Okay, Zena, thank you for this beautiful. Can you read Carol Francis Lungs? 
Um, so Zena, thank you for this beautiful piece. It resonates for me as I lost both my parents this past year and have had many moments of public grieving. Your father's death was very public and I'm curious to know if you grieved publicly before the video was made. No, not at all, no. I didn't even cry personally. I didn't cry at all for like 10 years. And that's kind of why I made the film. So um, no, not at all. And it was just to deal with that. And also we were at the forefront of that, you know, that whole situation. It was my older brother who's also now dead, sadly. And he's the one that was like in the front of having to manage all of this, his own personal grief and the kind of the public interest and onslaught. So, you know, he was the one that had to tangle with that. And he wrote a beautiful book in the shadow of a saint that sort of deals with that, that navigating all of that. Um, so um, no, I didn't. In the, my film, the art was the way that I dealt with it. Um, would I want to explain the context? I'm like, no, not at all. I don't like like politicizing things in that way. I'm not like an activist. I don't do that. You know, you can go and Google it yourself and find out more about it. And it's implicit in my name. So the whole point is that you read the name, you read the title, and then there's luckily like a bit of literature around like this particular piece, but also tons about my father. So that's where you go to find it. But my work is my work. And um, hopefully it's also going to be just like for everybody and anyone can relate to it. And you don't have to necessarily know about this history necessarily, but you know, the information is there if you need it. Display and scale. I think we discussed display and scale, right? And atmosphere. Um, I mean, you know, okay. So does scale play a role in creating a kind of effective atmosphere? Certainly if it's like immersive, I know that's a, popular thing right now in art if it's like dominates you and it's all around you and that kind of thing so um yeah I think that can happen um right now I haven't played with that enough I think you know that's something I really would like to think about a little bit more and I think with the desert scenes coming up with Eucaria there's an opportunity to do something quite fun with that probably if I in the kind of the the, the installation version of Eucaria um and not the film version but um yeah I do think that yeah scale has a, a massive role to play and I think that it's really exciting when people go small I've only done it once or twice like really microscopic on the wall I think there's something a little bit interesting in that too but um I haven't done enough work on that yet um someone said they had comments but didn't write them uh beauty is a portal um, blah, blah. Has my work been shown in the Niger Delta and what has the reception been by fellow Nigerians? Yes, I have a gallery. I had a gallery. I think it's coming to an end now. Boys Quarters. Um, yeah, I don't feel like it's the right thing to continue with doing, but I've shown my work that I was supposed to show the work of an artist and that sort of like fell apart at the last minute. And so I um, had to put in an artist I put myself in, which is uh, not uncommon in Nigeria anyway, if you have an, your own gallery to put your own work in. So um, I remember Busi Silver saying like, duh, of course you should put your own work in. That's like what Nigerians do. So I put my own work in. They've seen Saragu and Morning. They've seen, um, um, Niger Delta, a documentary, the one with the red chair. I'm changing that title, by the way, I don't like it anymore. And Table Manners. And so, yes, so the, and the uh, reception's great. I absolutely adore watching Table Manners, my eating series with Nigerian. You know, <laughs> sort of like laughing and going, Jay! And they're laughing and it's just like the most fun thing ever. And Nigerians are like massively politically correct and just say what they think. <laughs> and it's just hilarious. I love it. I love it. Um, I could make a film about watching Nigerians watch things or watching table maps. Um, What's your project? NT question. What is that? I'm not sure. I was wondering, but I know that, um, let's see. Oh, okay. Yeah, I love Foray. Foray's Requiem is one of my favorites. That's why the Requiem was in, was, um, in the Eucaria piece. <sighs> Where can you see my work in the future? Um, well, I have a show coming up in LA um, at Bridge Projects. Uh, an amazing show that's all about um, black breath and the Pentecostal breath. It's by, um, and I've just forgotten the title, so please forgive me, the wonderful cur curators, Cara and Jasmine, I've forgotten the name, but it's amazing. It opens on the 9th of April, Bridge Projects LA. That's said to be a really exciting work and we're showing Prayer Warriors. Um, one of, there's multiple art artists in it, but they're showing my, two, two of my works. One is Prayer Warriors and the other one is um, um, Breathing Orchestra. 
So I'm really, really excited to be showing Prayer Warriors because I haven't, you know, it's only ever had two outings. So this is like a, the perfect place for this to come out. So there's that. I think there's a Biennale or two coming out, you know, San Paolo Biennale and Kochi Biennale, if that's still happening. But, you know, COVID, everything's a bit like weird and possibly things around the freeze time um, with my latest project, which is about gin. And so that's coming up. Have I stopped crying? Yeah, I kind of have. I haven't cried in a long time. It's weird. Adejoke Togbiele, who's also one of your artists, I believe. She was acquired a few years ago and a, a wonderful Nigerian artist. And yes, and thank you. She said, have I stopped crying? <laughs> no, um, no, sadly. And yes, in some ways, but you know, I've lost, we've lost a lot of family members actually since my father. So it's not been like two brothers and one of my brother's sons. So it's been kind of hellish time actually. Um, but in terms of crying in my work, it's not there at all. And I was, also I'm just, also I'm to LA and I feel a bit, I'm much happier here. <laughs> and I feel actually weirdly more connected to what I'm trying to do in Nigeria, in Potako. And I see this weird connection between Potako and Lagos and Potako and Los Angeles, sorry, because they're both oil towns. And, you know, and I can see like, you know, the popo trees, papaya trees here, guava, all the things that you'd have in Nigeria, you can have here. And it's just like, oh, there's this weird kind of, symmetry and it's like I love and I love it I really enjoy it more so I can tap into my internal joy better here let's put it that way and so I think my work is more transcendental and I'm more connected to the cosmic here as well and I yeah I have more space so yeah I feel like on some level yes I've stopped crying even though more bad things are for sure going to happen I'm sure but you know I'm my response is different um but you know it's just what the world, we've got like lots of horrible things coming in this world but also lots of beautiful things it's just your, the question is how are you gonna manage it and I've done I've had a lot of horrible things happen and I'm you know crying is uh, my crying isn't going to be generative enough so I'm putting it into my art do you actively practice to recommend moments of catharsis I just say this, I'm afraid it has to be the last question but I like oh. the idea of ending on catharsis so do you actively practice or recommend moments of catharsis for healing as well as inspiration? Sorry, can, sorry, I'm a bit, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the last, can we ask the last question as well, the Shaheen Ishmael Begi, that's a really great question. But that first oh, one- sorry, there's so many, uh, I hadn't noticed a bunch more came in, yes. Um, I was so moved to finally see your work in person in the Brooklyn Museum iteration of the Disguise exhibition. Um, to me oh. that- question oh sorry sorry um a museum's amplifying a polyphony of diasporic voices making mm. work with disguise and the mask each one specific in practice while it does not at all absolve themselves from colonialist and imperialist <clears throat> histories and ongoing racist practices towards artists, publics, staff, it was amazing step in the right direction. Yeah. I want the show's catalog to live on as it is the kind of show some of us are waiting for. That said, what did it feel like for you as is shown in its reception and being alongside a range of artists, what problems did it perpetuate? And I mean, then, this yeah. history was like, there was the show was, I had a very, fraught history but then when um kevin um <laughs> came in the... mine at the national museum of african art a wonderful curator and um de michelle is his surname and he made everything like 100 times better and it was a wonderful you know it just felt wonderful at that point and i love the conversation that it was having it's a really important conversation and i made a film called worrying the mask um which is a, a, docu a sort of documentary basically about you know, querying the, you know, the role of, well, it does a lot of things, but I think the questions I was asking in wearing the mask is in the skies. And I think it's just in the world right now. And we are thinking about, yeah, you know, what does it mean to have these like traditional artworks in these museums? And, and my thing is like, I don't think that like returning it and knee jerk reactions are the initial, you know, it's not, I don't think actually that's the necessarily the right thing to do. It might be the right thing to do, but it might not be the right thing to do. And actually it's more about the storytelling around the sub, around the objects that matters. And that's, these are opportunities. So let's not throw it away. Actually, it's not, it's easier, far easier just to be like, oh, let's just make an action. So we like, it, we seem politically correct, but actually I think we should ask 
deeper questions of ourselves and think about how we curate and the conversations around it. That's why Disguise was really, really an amazing, um, amazing show, especially the way that um, um, Kevin put this together. And I would, you know, I think it deserves another outing, but with more space this time, because I think also the space was contracted at the Brooklyn Museum. Um, so it's a place, I think it deserves to be a museum that cares about African art and cares about, um, you know, and understands the, uh, the politics of, of space and um, all, of, all of those things. So I think that this is a conversation that's happening, but I think instead of like giving things back and just being terrified, I just think let's actually just do, let's like everyone put their hands in and let's actually work on this and, you know, and maybe offend each other and then maybe say sorry and then think about, you know, go back to the drawing board and try again, but we have to have the conversation. And I think it should be rugged and vigorous and really fun and respectful. And I have to answer the last question. You want to talk about spiritual hygiene in the wake of a pandemic. I love, I'm big on hygiene. I think about emotional hygiene a lot. I think about spiritual hygiene a lot. And um, in the wake of a pandemic, I mean, I just um, eat well, you know, call your mother and your father and keep in contact with everyone. Um, look at lots of memes and share good memes and, you know, take walks if you can in nature and you know and let go and take lots of baths i know people have not been taking baths and it's understandable because you're in a lot so people have been going a week without a bath i know that this is the, the truth of the matter you don't want to admit it but have a bath it really helps so that's why i think spiritual <laughs> hygiene is connected to to joy and to physical cleanliness and nature i took one last night and told my kids they weren't allowed to come and and interrupt. <laughs> so on that note, thank you everyone, especially Zena, so much for joining us this evening. If you are eager for more brilliant women artists, screenings and conversations, also supported by the American Women's History Initiative, please check out the Women Filmmakers Festival through March 21st on the Smithsonian American Art Museum website. And meet us back here on April 4th for next month's Viewfinder, Margaret Salmon on Motherhood and the Everyday, taking place on April 1st at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Appreciate you. And stay safe, everyone. Wear your masks. <laughs>